Good afternoon. Welcome to the IR Theory interview series. I am Dr. Jon Obey, Senior Lecturer in the Department of Global Political Studies at Malmö University. In this interview series, we interview IR scholars about their preferred theoretical perspectives. The idea is to get a brief account of why scholars have come to appreciate a certain IR theory. Today, I have the honor to interview a great scholar. Welcome, Professor Thaddeus or Patrick Thaddeus Jackson. <laughs> Hi, Jan. Nice to see you. Thanks for inviting me. All right. So before we start with the more specific questions about the um, uh, IR theory and some concepts and so on, uh, could you please tell me about your scholarly background? Sure. So when I was in undergrad, uh, the thing that I was most interested in was very sort of critical political economy style approaches. I was trained by or worked with an undergrad, a student, someone who had been a student of Robert Cox's. And so it was a lot of critical work on questions of economic hegemony. But what I quickly got more interested in as we started doing that were issues of global identity and how questions of identity kind of interacted with power. And so I then went to Columbia uh, with the intent of working with John Ruggie who was a prominent early constructivist. Um, and I was, I overlapped with John Ruggie for about a year before he went to become an assistant secretary general at the United Nations and has since gone on to do a lot of work on global compact stuff about sort of human rights codes for businesses and so on and so forth. So his career kind of went in a slightly different direction than, than a typical academic career. Um, but I had gone specifically to work with him to kind of explore this intersection of identity, power, language, these kinds of things. And I ended up uh, putting together a committee of people, some historians, some folks who did more, uh, more sort of critical international relations such stuff. Um, and then someone like Jack Snyder, actually, who was on my committee as kind of the, the typical IR guy. Um, so it was an interesting blend of, of things that kind of, uh, kind of came together. And then I also found in grad school, uh, my longtime friend and co-author, Daniel Nexon, yeah. he had written, I think we counted last time, and I think we're up to a dozen pieces we've written together, yeah. and we've just yeah. committed to sort of two more. So that conversation has also really helped to kind of shape my, my way of thinking about these things. So that's kind of, the, kind of the intellectual soil, I guess, out of which my work grows. Mm. Okay, that, that's really nice to hear, quite uh, dynamic and um, you change ways uh, as, as you go, right? Um, but uh, where are you working now, by the way? So for the last 20 years, I've been at American University in yeah. Washington, DC. And uh, the school that I'm in is called the School of International Service. And it's different within the US constellation, right? Because outside the United States, a lot of international relations programs are freestanding. They're schools of global studies or whatever. In the United States, most international relations scholars work in political science departments. Mm -hmm. And political science in the United States is very much sort of the, the agenda for political science is set by the people who do research on American politics, because of course there are just so many of them in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's, you're always as an IR scholar in a political science department, you're always a little bit of a minority figure okay. in terms of the power constellation. What's yeah. interesting about where I am is that it's an entire school of international affairs. Mm. We've got 140 faculty, um, not, the majority of them are not political scientists. Mm -hmm. I think political scientists constitute the plurality of, of the folks on the faculty, but we've got geographers and anthropologists and economists and sociologists and public health people and conflict resolution practitioners and a whole variety of other things. So it's a very interesting constellation, which is very different than mm -hmm. what you get in a lot of the rest of the United States for people who are working on, on international affairs in particular. The nice thing about it is it's allowed me over the course of my career to work in areas that are a little outside of the political science mainstream. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I've done a lot of work on philosophy of science and philosophy of social science. That's not even, that's not even really a subfield in the political science side of international relations, but over where I am, it's perfectly acceptable for me to be able to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, it, it's been an interesting blessing to be in a place that is not as disciplinary, shall we say, but is much more of a multidisciplinary school. Okay, more dynamic, more interdisciplinary. That's really nice. 
um, okay, uh, now we have the whole class wanting to go there to do their PhDs. So. <laughs> We have a PhD program and we are happy to take applications. We have actually the things we do really, really well at the graduate level at, in, in the School of International Service. We do really good development studies work. Mm -hmm. We do really good sort of critical security stuff. Okay. And we do really good what you might call global IR. So yeah. because besides myself, there's also Amitabh Acharya is mm -hmm. there. It was, of course, as president of the International Studies Association a few years ago, is the one who issued the rather stirring call in his presidential address for IR to really globalize and really yeah. not yeah. just be kind of a Western US dominated field um, and really start bringing in different sorts of perspectives from all around the world. Uh, so we have a fair number of people working uh, in broadly what you might call global IR. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that if a student wanted to follow one of those paths, we're definitely a good place. So, you know, apply, come join yeah. us. Yeah, no, Global IR is, uh, we have touched upon that as well. And um, actually we have a master's in global politics and Global IR is part of that as well. So nice. Amitabh Ashari is a known figure actually among the people. Uh, so yeah. Okay. All right. We're actually, yeah. I, I, can, I can think I can break this news here for the first time, but he and I are actually putting together for the spring a virtual conference on Global IR, where okay. we're going to be inviting a variety of people and having some, some speakers kind of think through the question of like what a Global IR curriculum actually looks like. Mm. So watch for that. We'll probably, we'll probably set it up. What we'll probably do is we'll probably do it as a set of Zoom calls and then we'll do like a, we'll do a webinar version so people can sort of listen and then maybe post some questions. So we're still trying to work out the format, but we're working on that for the spring. Okay, I will let the, the head of department know and uh, my friend who is responsible for the master's program in global politics. So they might cool. contact me as well. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, yeah, you have done some very uh, enlightening and groundbreaking, I would say, and very useful work on IR theory as well as methodology. Um, and some of that work is together with Daniel Nexon that you mentioned, but you also uh, wrote this uh, very good book, uh, The Conduct of Inquiry, um, uh, which we use in, at the master's level. But I don't really want to focus on that part at the moment. Uh, I, rather, I would rather focus on the theory uh, mm. work that you have done. And if I identify you correctly, uh, or if I categorize you, which is, which I should not do perhaps. Uh, but you identify as a realist constructivist, if I'm correct. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not correct, but if I'm correct, I mean, at least, what, what does this combination of theoretical categories really mean? How can we combine these two? And what are some of the key realist constructivist insights when it comes to IR research? That's a, it's a great question. So just a, a quick sort of backstory, um, the reason why Dan Nexon and I kind of first came up with this category, and it's interesting because we came up with it about the same time as Sammy Barkin came up with it. It's right. just he managed to get the book written before uh, before we did. So he got he got the Realist Constructivism book, which is a great book, by the way. Right. Um, but a number of us, and I think it's not an accident that we we're all trained at Columbia. Mm -hmm. I mean, Barkin was a few years ahead of Dan and I, but what we were trying to, to, what we were reacting to, right, what all of us were reacting to was the way that the first generation of constructivists in the United States tended to emphasize what you might call good norms. Mm -hmm. So constructivism in the hands of Finnamore and Sickink and Mike Barnett and, uh, uh, you know, Audie Klott, some of the some of the early really groundbreaking people who who sort of produced this, was all about the way that certain kinds of good ideas could influence politics for the better. So you ended up with a lot of work on social movements and peace and the way that ideas that were contrary to the realist ideas of power and struggle and competition could actually be victorious in certain cases. Um, and of course, Alex Went in his famous 1992 piece, Anarchy is What States Make of It, had kind of proclaimed that as like the direction for constructivism, the alliance between constructivists and what he called strong liberals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a number of us in what you might call the second generation, or depending on how you count generations, the third generation of constructivists. Um, so myself, Dan, Sammy Barkin, uh, folks in that sort of, uh, that sort of area, mm -hmm we're never really satisfied with that articulation of constructivism mm -hmm. because on the one hand, we want to say, yes, okay, ideational and cultural phenomena matter in world politics, but we didn't want to set up 
the idea that somehow the only way you could know that ideas mattered is if you had power pointing in one direction and policy going in another direction and you say, oh, ideas are what sort of were responsible for policy going in this other direction. Um, also, we came of intellectual age reading Nietzsche and Foucault and Max Weber and uh, all of these sort of great sociologists, political sociologists of power, mm -hmm. and recognizing that when we talk about cultural and ideational dynamics, we're not necessarily talking about an alternative to power, we're talking about an alternative form of power, or a mm -hmm. different way of exercising power. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the categories in the field, the way that things were set up is like power was kind of owned by the realists, and liberals owned interest and then constructivist owned ideas. So then if constructivism and liberalism were kind of allied, there was really no place to say, we're interested in culture and ideas, but we're also interested in power. Like that category just didn't exist. Um, and so what we wanted to, or to the extent that it existed, it was hard to express because of the dominant language that had been sort of put out. Um, and so what we decided to do was we tried to articulate this category and it turns out that if you go back, you sort of follow the trail that originally Richard Ashley had kind of uh, figured out in his detailed reconstruction of Morgenthau as really being sort of opposed to the thinner version of realism that was that was on offer in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, he, so Ashley went back and reread Morgenthau and said, look, there's a lot of interesting stuff here about power and identity. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what you can get in this, all this sort of realist alternative. But we have to sort of go one step further than Morgenthau was willing to go because Morgenthau is still in some ways uh, trying to tie everything down to material dynamics. And so what we realized and sort of thinking that through was, oh, okay. So what you could do here is you could say that realism is really about the inescapability of power. And constructivism maybe isn't about ideas, but constructivism is really about the question of whether social relations can be sort of renegotiated or whether they're quasi natural things that are fixed in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so by kind of respecifying what we meant by constructivism that allowed us to produce this other category, which was realist constructivism mm -hmm. and say, okay, so we are interested in power. We do think that a lot of politics is about, about power and struggle, but mm -hmm. not all of that power and struggle is about material or physical means. And it's mm -hmm. not always reducible to things like who has more guns. Mm -hmm. There are cultural and ideational dimensions to the way power is exercised. So in that sense, it very much took on board this sort of Foucauldian insight that power is everywhere, but combined that with the constructivist emphasis that really the, the, the place where a lot of the interesting work was happening would not be necessarily in the kind of physical uh, side of things, but in the cultural and ideational side of things. Now, of course, we weren't the first people to kind of blaze that. There were people who were doing Gramscian approaches to hegemony who had sort of gotten there as well. Um, mm -hmm. Although for them, a lot of this then also had to be tied into a broader kind of mater historical materialist story about like the evolution of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really want mm -hmm. to to that. And so we want to say, okay, there's other ways you can do this. So that's kind of where the realism constructivism category came from. I think in terms of the, the key sets of, of insights or concepts, for me at least, um, I tend to think that realist constructivism is a particularly good place to explore things like agency and creativity and contingency. Mm -hmm. And I sort of put those together. Um, mm -hmm because what we're talking about here is how creative situated social action is able to both reproduce and transform sets of relations that people find themselves in. So if I am an official speaking on behalf of a state and I utilize certain kinds of diplomatic codes and I reproduce them, I speak that language, I'm also kind of reproducing the grammar of that language itself. And in so doing, I'm contributing to the world sort of continuing to be figured in the way that it is. And by analyzing that and looking at these moments of contingency where it, people say are situated in such a way that they could have chosen different kinds of vocabularies for characterizing things. Mm -hmm. Things aren't threats because they're just threats. They're made threatening. Mm -hmm. And we can examine how they were made threatening, recover the counterfactual trajectories that weren't actually explored and say, look, this is where dynamic creative agency made a difference. Mm -hmm. That people could have, after, say, September 11th, framed 
the attacks in the United States in a different way and thus created something very different. Or the way that the way that, that COVID-19 has been framed in the United States mm -hmm. has led to these policies that are sort of disastrous and leading to, you know, USA number one in deaths, right? So it, it has not produced a great outcome, but it would be senseless in the way I'm looking at it to try to trace that back to some intrinsic material capability of the virus, because it has to do with how we've configured and the meaning we make of the virus and the policies that we enact and how we weigh off questions of public health versus individual liberty and that whole mix, which I think it makes the most sense through this kind of realist constructivist lens. Yes, it's about culture and identity and language, but it's also about power struggles and about the ways that people kind of try to gain influence over one another. So that to me, those are the kinds of insights that, that attract me to that kind of realist constructivist blend. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for that elaboration. And you also touch upon uh, another question that I was going to ask about the key concepts. So we might get back to that again, but I would like to ask some follow-up questions. Sure. Uh, if, if that is okay. No problem. Yeah. Um, uh, so where does the material factors come in in this realist uh, or this uh, constructive realist uh, equation? Because you say it's not just about material factors, but we have all of these ongoing discursive struggles, if we like. Yeah. What makes realist constructivism different from like Ted Hoff's perspective, uh, his constructivist perspective, where he emphasized discursive struggle, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. What makes a realist uh, or a constructivist realist or realist constructivist, depending on how you also had a discussion about that, yes. how you should actually phrase it, but uh, maybe <laughs> that is, um, yeah. but in any case, um, um, I mean, wh where does the material factor come in? I mean, is it only, okay, we have these discursive uh, struggles, we have these these power struggles that are about how to frame things, how to uh, construct threats and so on. But uh, realism, and you use realism, and you combine realism with constructivism, there still needs to be some kind of emphasis or some kind of relation to material factors nonetheless, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not... One of the things that, that, that I've been really keen to elaborate over the course of my career is the difference between a perspective that takes cultural ideational discursive phenomena seriously and idealism, mm. right? Because a kind of, of subjective idealism that would somehow say that like ideas matter and ideas are more important than material factors. Just that whole debate strikes me as kind of misguided mm -hmm. because, and this is what I think one of the, one of the more brilliant insights that Alex Went had in, in his early work, that to talk about the material is already to be talking about things that have been imbued with cultural meaning. Mm. Because material as a category is already kind of a cultural category that we utilize. So when a realist says, yes, but there's an objective reality to a tank because it can come and like attack your borders and it can kill people. Um, okay, except that the tank doing things is itself a cultural construct. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that the value of the person's life is the most important thing. So the fact that the tank can kill people, the tank can do other things too. The tank can crush forests, right? Why isn't that the most important thing about the tank? Mm -hmm. So it's not that there aren't physical capacities to things. And I prefer to say physical capacities than material mm -hmm. because in IR at least, material is this very strange category, yeah. right? Because I think, and this is one of the things that, that Dan and I kind of realized early on as we were, we were working through this, the material in IR, when people call something material, what they seem to mean is not amenable to deliberate social reconstruction or manipulation. Mm -hmm. So, so relatively parametrically fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and our whole approach, though, is to say, well, if something appears to be that way, then there's a history as to how it got that way. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, and, and my favorite example when it comes to, to real to bring up the tank thing is I'll say, okay, but look, there's all of these debates about like the strategy of how you use tanks. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, yes, it is clearly trivially true that if a tank did not have certain physical capacities, then certain things could not be done with the tank. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you can't invert that. 
So just because the tank has certain physical capacities does not exhaustively tell you what the tank is good for or what its impact is going to be. So there is a kind of necessary incompleteness to the purely physical account of these things. And a lot of traditional realist analysis doesn't acknowledge that because they are more concerned with saying, here are certain kinds of physical capacities and we have to take account of those. And what I'm trying to do is more open it up to say, okay, yes, those are physical capacities that the tank has. But what's really interesting is why only those capacities and not other capacities are the ones that are actually being utilized here. Mm -hmm. So construction in this sense is not an ideational, we can make anything into anything we want. Mm -hmm. It's more of a creative redeployment of possibilities. So if you look at strategic debates in the use of tanks, right, the whole, the whole thing that, the, that the, the theorists who figured out about, about the use of, use of tanks in, in the early days of the Second World War to do blitzkrieg maneuvers with them, um, you know, blitzkrieg was, was a way of saying there are things you can do with tanks that we hadn't thought of before, and mm -hmm. now let's do it. Mm -hmm. And of course, once it's there, well, now, now that's, just, that's just what tanks do. Well, it wasn't before. I mean, they could, they had the possibility of doing it, but the, the, the way you get to an actually observed social outcome is not exhaustively determined by the physical capacity. The same way that the COVID policies that we have are, it's not like they ignore the physical sort of potentiality of the way the COVID virus works, but that's not exhaustive. So simply knowing how the virus works in a genetic or physical sort of epidemiological way doesn't exhaustively tell you what kinds of policies we would enact and therefore what kind of outcomes we would get. Mm -hmm. So it's more for me about the necessary incompleteness of the physical than it is about saying like material factors don't matter, if that distinction makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And it, it, but in some sense, it seems that that critique is more directed to structural realists. Yeah. But if, if we uh, go to classical realists or some kind of yeah, classical or Christian realist or whatever we make of it, do you as realists constructivists share uh, the um, nature of man as a, as a flawed human being, as, as a human being that is, that is um, uh, yeah, prone to struggle, prone to, to, to sin in the Christian realist uh, uh, terminology or, or uh, yeah. Um, do you share this pessimistic outlook on man? Well, I, I mean, that, and that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And I think I would have to say, like, there's a difference between any answer I could give for sort of the whole category and then an answer for me personally. Yeah. Um, I know that there are certainly elements of, say, Reinhold Niebuhr's work mm -hmm. that that when I read, you know, I read the irony of American history and I, it looks very realist constructivist to me in, mm. in lots of places um, because of where, where Niebuhr places the, the particular kinds of flaws and sources of, mm. of, of certain sorts of policies. Um, and theologically, I find, I find Niebuhr absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, not quite my favorite theologian, but close. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that that uh, that, that kind of, of chastened political realism has a lot to recommend it. Mm -hmm. There was a great book a few years ago, a couple of uh, a couple of, of analysts and some local think tanks wrote a book called Ethical Realism, mm -hmm. um, which is really neat because it really goes back and tries to recover some of those more more Niburian roots of a kind of humble realism, um, which I thought was just a really fascinating project. Mm -hmm. um, but the category human nature, I think, is not necessary for mm -hmm. realist constructivism. Mm -hmm. um, I, there, there, I think there's a couple of different kinds of, of what Donald Moon would have called models of man, unfortunately, with his you know, 1970s sexist language. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, that's what he called them. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that these theories have a certain sense at their core of like what human beings are and what social action is. Mm -hmm. And at least for me, my approach to social action or the kind of model that I tend to operate with is much more of a pragmatist model. Mm -hmm. So it's much more human beings as embedded in sets of social relations and, and the human being arising at the intersection of different kinds of ties. Mm -hmm. And so for me, where, I mean, if we want to use the, the theological language and talk about like sin or flaw, I would root it not in the individual, mm -hmm. but in the pattern. So it's more okay. social sin, if you, want to, if you want to use the kind of theological language. So okay. there are flaws, certainly, but there are flaws in the way that these things have, mm. been, have been put together. Um, 
And then I think people can, people can, one of the things that differentiates realist constructivism from say more liberal constructivism is uh, the question of whether, whether one can engineer those flaws away. Mm, and exactly, I yeah. think realist constructivists, certainly I tend to be a bit more pessimistic. Uh, I don't think you can, it's just a question of like rightly designing your institutions. Yeah, it's yeah. more, how do you channel conflict in ways that might be less destructive mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, sort of push off in that direction. There are other realist constructivists though, or other people I might sort of put loosely in that camp who are much more comfortable with the human nature language mm -hmm. and, and will certainly sort of develop the notion of, of human nature in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's some of the, some of the work that, uh, that Annette Freiberg has done. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and some other folks who were sort of doing this more critical kind of approach to thinking about human nature in those, those senses. The point of the realist constructivism label is not to throw people out, it's to open thinking space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think if we approach it that way, then certainly there are realist constructivist aspects to a lot of the contemporary critical work on human nature. That's mm -hmm. not just reproducing like, you know, old classical assumptions about human nature, but really trying to do something much more interesting with it. Mm -hmm. so. okay, okay, thank you for that uh, answer. Uh, very interesting. I, I actually, I, ha I, I have another question, but I have, to, um, I have to keep it because I want to ask other questions as well. Please. Uh, maybe we can take that another time. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so if, if we go to more, uh, if, we, if we go to your own research, what you've actually written, what you've published, what you're working with, what you're reading, um, um, and what you are uh, publishing and so on, um, if you were to choose uh, two or three core realist constructivist concepts, mm -hmm. uh, which ones would you choose and why? So I think the first one I would point to would be agency. And I, I say it deliberately agency rather than agent, because I'm not talking about a sort of essential actor, but more of... Um, to do a good realist constructivist analysis, I think you always have to follow the exercise of agency. You have to look at the ways in which people act and perform things. Now this can be cashed out in a couple of different ways. For myself personally, I rather like the language that we get from say American pragmatists like John Dewey, mm -hmm. uh, where embedded creativity, social, socially embedded action is kind of the creative redeployment of different resources that we have around us. Um, there are other realist constructivists, including my frequent co-author, Dan Nexon, who are uh, more comfortable with some of the social network language about positionality and would utilize that as, as the sort of default language. So you think about some of Dan's work on empire and mm -hmm. the way that Dan cashes out what an empire is by talking about different sort of network patterns of core periphery relations, mm -hmm. and different kinds of contracts that can be that can be done between cores and peripheries or hegemons and, and, and areas on the on the periphery of, of a particular mm -hmm. polity. Um, and so he's more comfortable sort of using that. For me, I would tend to look at the kind of positionalities I'm interested in tend to be much more sort of social and cultural positionalities. So mm -hmm. in my work on the West, mm -hmm. right? So the, 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 the West is not a thing. Mm -hmm. The West is a set of, discursive rhetorical commonplaces that people deploy and utilize in different mm -hmm. ways. And focusing on that moment of utilization, focusing on that use mm -hmm. is something that I think is really key. And I, for me, that's agency, right? Is the use of these kinds of resources. So resources are just kind of out there and inert until somebody does something with them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and if, it, uh, if it sort of hadn't already been monopolized by the practice turned people, I would have pointed to practice. Mm -hmm. uh, although I think what, what I would tend to mean by practice is a little different than some of the practice turned folks. Mm -hmm. um, although I find Emmanuel Adler's most recent articulation of this stuff in world ordering to be kind of along the lines of, of what I would like. Um, you know, because what we're talking here about is the idea that apparently stable social arrangements have to be understood as contingent products of stabilization. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we treat those things as if they were uh, natural facts. Mm -hmm. And once we do that, we've then lost some of that constructivist creative moment. Um, and I think that's, that's 
a tendency that one falls into a lot that I want to sort of oppose. So for me, that that's kind of why focusing on the agency and creativity is, is so darn important to this kind of realist constructivist work. Um, can, can, I, can I just challenge please. you there, or uh, not challenge you, but ask a question at least mm -hmm. in relation to what you just mentioned? Because in one, you mentioned Dan a lot, and in one of your articles, uh, uh, I think it's the article called uh, Foregrounding uh, something or uh, where you... Um, launched this concept of scientific ontologies and you made yeah, a the foregrounding ontology article yep mm -hmm. yeah uh, and when you make this tripartite distinction between actor centric uh, practice near or experience near and social yep. relational theory right yep. Uh, yep. yeah so you 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 used agency and um, and you deliberately did not want to use agent but then you have the actor centric theories at one level yep. Yep. and then you mentioned practice term that you or somehow kind of closely related to the practice right. from people, but that is one set of, of, of theories. And then right. you have social relational perspectives, uh, which uh, uh, emphasize p positionality uh, and not so much agency. And, and, and uh, you, Well, I would, let me yeah. stop you there for a second. Yeah. Yeah, it does emphasize, it yeah. does emphasize agency, but it, it, it is sort of a, what you might call a decentralized or distributed form of agency. Right. So usually we tend to think that agency is concentrated in an agent. So I have agency. It's a property that I have as an agent and I do things, therefore. Mm -hmm. um, but the kind of agency that, that I'm talking about is, is less a dispositional characteristic of an actor and mm -hmm. more a set of social capacities that mm -hmm. an actor has. Mm -hmm. So to give you, I'll give you a really sort of contemporary example. Um, you know, we're having this conversation, we're having this conversation by Zoom. Yeah, yeah. A year ago, Zoom didn't exist. There were other video conferencing systems, but nothing quite as ubiquitous and seamless as, as the way Zoom has been able to put this together. Mm -hmm. um, in my accounting, our conditions of agency have changed mm -hmm. because we have different capacities that we could not have previously. And those capacities are not somehow rooted in me or in you. Mm -hmm. They're rooted in the social environment that we are a part of. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that there is an agency, it's that agency is distributed into these sets of relations. Mm -hmm. And to say that a particular actor has agency mm -hmm. is to make a comment on how they are positioned relative to these different sorts of resources. Mm -hmm. The piece you mentioned where, where Dan and I sort of cut the, the social theory field up a little bit differently, um, it's interesting because like we're using slightly different vocabulary there, but trying to achieve a similar purpose mm -hmm. of opening up space to be able to think in this way. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason we switched vocabulary for that particular piece is it's not the case that the union of realism and constructivism is necessarily social relational. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just that social relational ways of cashing out those insights kind of make sense to us. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of what we wanted to articulate that way. Mm -hmm. I could certainly imagine a realist constructivist that wasn't especially relational. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be that person. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a student of mine that wanted to go that way, I would probably suggest that they spent a lot of time sort of looking at the relational versions and explaining why they didn't want to go that way. And if they wanted to, cool, you know, but just like look at that option. Because to me, the most natural blending of a realist sensibility about power and struggle and a constructivist sensibility about creativity, contingency and agency is a kind of social relational active process of construction. Mm -hmm. that's really what we should be looking at uh, mm -hmm. in order to in order to do these things so that to me is kind of how the how those things hang together mm -hmm. but certainly there may be other ways in which people might articulate those but that's mm -hmm. that's the one that makes sense mostly to me mm -hmm. um, so and part I mean, and honestly part of that is part of that is from study and part of that is just from i don't know the way i've grown up i guess i i uh I'm the oldest of a very, of a very large family, uh, mm -hmm. lots of kids. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my parents had, there were seven of us and they adopted several dozen more actually. Mm -hmm. So there were large numbers of people around. So mm -hmm. identity was always kind of a negotiated thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that is awesome actually. Wow. And, and, that, and that, that, that is one of the things that I think kind of marks my, my sensibility about the world. I tend to yeah. think that, oh, okay, so you have an identity. Great. Let's not talk about what it is. It is. Let's talk about how you maintain it, yeah. how you articulate it, how you produce yeah. it, how to you use, fight for it. To, to use the sort of Judith Butler language, how it's performed. Yeah. 
Mm. Right. So, so it pushes us out of, out of the individual subject into like the process of subject making. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's opened up by that realist constructivist sensibility. And again, it's not even, it's not just realist constructivists who opened this up, right? Cindy Weber was talking about this with simulating sovereignty and some of her work on the way states were produced. Mm -hmm. uh, David Campbell was talking about this from, again, from a more post-structural uh, mm -hmm. approach by looking at the way that threat was constituted. Mm -hmm. So there are certainly other avenues that people have used to kind of get toward these insights. This is the one, realist constructivism was kind of the intervention in mainstream IR debates, which for reasons that I'm sure we could talk about theologically, always come in threes. <laughs> yeah, exactly, um, exactly, exactly. Why? Why? Why is it like that? And so we said, no, they're not just three. You've got these different things, but actually we could at least have four. And yeah. so it was an attempt to produce yeah. some space in there. So what, what Jim George and David Campbell called thinking space in this uh, article that they wrote in International Studies Quarterly about 30 years ago. Uh, which, which is probably one of the most impactful articles I've ever read in my career, because it's one of these articles that just the way they formulate it, and they say, oh, part of the point of theoretical innovation is not just to answer questions, but it's actually to create space to think about questions in different ways. And I was like, wow, wow, yeah, that's there. That's what I'd love to be able to do. So that was what we were deliberately trying to do. Like, how do we open up thinking space? By, by introducing these categories. Mm -hmm. Again, not to exclude, but to sort of open up different possibilities. Yeah. And we only, we only touched upon one, even though we touched upon many concepts, uh, you only mentioned one, uh, specifically agency. Uh, if, if, could you take one more? Do we have um, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that if, if, if I was to push another or look at another concept that comes out of that comes out of this, then I mean it would either be it's interesting because the two the it would be it would be reformulations of the two kind of dominant things that are associated with realism and constructivism. So power on the one hand and something like culture or identity on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that where a realist constructivist obviously has to foreground questions of power, but it's a reformulation of power. Mm -hmm. So that power in a more Foucauldian sense is, is distributed in capillary, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not concentrated in a particular place, um, but instead power is, power is distributed through sets of social relations and then empowers different kinds of actors to do different kinds of things at different times and empowers people to resist it in, in different ways, depending on kind of where they're, where they're located. So, you know, and, and for me, this kind of, to me, this is what makes sense out of, say, Max Weber's understanding of legitimate domination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the whole way that Weber's sociology is set up is that power tries to legitimate itself. Mm -hmm. And so the legitimation of domination becomes authority. And mm -hmm. that is kind of what, what Weber's interested in, his famous typologies of the way, the way government works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you have your traditional legal modes of authority and your rational, your, your traditional modes of authority, your rational legal modes of authority, your charismatic modes of authority. It's all about the claim of, of how it's okay for someone to exercise domination over someone else. Mm -hmm. Now, a sort of traditional realist would look at that and say, okay, how many guns does the person have or, you know, what kind of army do they have behind them? And that's what allows them to rule in particular ways. Mm -hmm. But I think what Weber opens up is, no, it's not just about that, because power isn't just the gun. Mm -hmm. Power is the publicly accepted right to use it in particular ways for particular reasons. And this is subtle. It's not always, this is explicitly okay. Sometimes it can be, I did this and nobody really resisted it, or the people who resisted it, I was able to sort of shut up. And so I sort of got away with that. Mm -hmm. um, which I think what you see now a lot in the United States with the use of, of troops to put down peaceful protesters and so on. Really mm -hmm. scary things that are going on in the United States at the moment. But um, the fact that there's not widespread outcry and general strike mm -hmm. is the sort of thing negotiation was that like permits that kind of power to continue, permits that, that kind of exercise of, of power to, to, to be authoritative. So it's reformulations of power away from just physical capacity mm -hmm. into 
social capacities and the negotiations about social capacities, which on the one hand, sure, allows us to say, here's the way that particular state leaders use physical force and how they justify that. But also here's how resistance to that comes from. And the reframing, what's the different language that the movements are using to resist, say, you know, the use of the use of the military to, to control protest or the use mm -hmm. of the police differentially against uh, against people of uh, of African-American heritage. Uh, mm -hmm. What does that are we going to sort of allow people to get away with that? Mm -hmm. Well, OK, if it's all about guns and power in the sort of classical physical sense, there's not much we can do. Mm -hmm. But if instead this is a negotiation process about what is legitimate, OK, now there's actually some possibility here. Mm -hmm. And that sort of is also sort of reflects into the, the reformulation of this culture and identity stuff in a, in a, in a much more kind of non-essentialist way. It's not as if there's a thing called the West that we could like enumerate the principles of in the way mm -hmm. that like Sam Huntington wants to do. Here mm -hmm. are the rules of what it means to be the West. Mm -hmm. OK, you can say that. But from a realist constructivist perspective, saying that mm. is an assertion of power where you're trying to sort of make it that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you say, wait a minute, okay, so hold on. Can we, can we step back a little bit? What, what makes those kinds of claims possible? And, and not what is identity, but how is identity produced in practice? Mm -hmm. So it changes the, the, the dynamic of that a little bit. So re to summarize that realist constructivism takes both power and questions of culture and identity very seriously, mm -hmm. but seriously in ways that are different from both the kind of traditional realist and traditional constructivist versions of these things. It seems, um, well, it sounds uh, similar to the concept of hegemony, uh, mm -hmm. I must say, uh, when you uh, express it like this. Similar, uh, <laughs> though I think that, that at least for me, and counter hegemony as well, of course, because the and, and the resistance which Gramsci emphasizes is all, always taking place in civil society, because it's in civil society where the counter hegemonic struggle needs to take place in order to change things and so on. And if it were possible to read Gramsci without embedding Gramsci's thought in a broader Marxist project of the mm. end of capitalism, then I think that would make sense. Mm, mm, I have yeah. a hard time reading Gramsci outside of that project because yeah. It seems pretty clear to me, at least in the way I've always read Gramsci, that the whole reason for hegemony is to help explain why the revolution hasn't actually occurred yet. <laughs> because yeah, 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 yeah. workers have the vote and they haven't voted to expropriate the capitalists. So what's yeah. going on? Oh, hegemony kind of fills in that gap. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think I think that that if you kind of detach the big picture from it, and you look at some of the, just the dynamics of of hegemonic and counter hegemonic uh, positioning, then mm. yeah, there's a lot in Gramsci that I find uh, that I find very amenable to the mm. way I want to think about these things. It's the bigger picture that it has to kind of get sorted into. My bigger picture tends to be much more the social relational kind of pragmatic picture, with like an open ended future of the ways in which different kinds of relations could combine. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's it's the sort of thing where I I, I get on very well with Gramscians as long yeah. as we don't start talking about you know the inevitable demise of capitalism because then yeah. I then I start to I, I get a little nervous about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, good. I, I have two more questions actually, um, and um, one is about uh, policy advice. The other is about advice to the students. Uh, I mean, maybe we we have already been speaking for a long time feel free to uh, reject one of the questions but if you could uh, answer one if we have uh, if we are lucky you can answer two but if you just choose one that is fine so in terms of policy relevance how would a realist constructivist uh, approach inform policy and also before we leave any advice to the IR students at the university well I can actually sort of answer address both of them with the same notion mm -hmm. uh, I think and the notion that I would want to put in here is the notion of contingency. So from a policy perspective, a lot of the times that policymakers are asking academic experts for policy advice, they, they want to know what to do, right? They want to know what the, what the best course of action is. Mm -hmm. And what a realist constructivist, I think, would say in the first instance is that kind of knowledge depends on having some kind of essential grasp of the way the world is configured. And if instead we take the realist constructivist insight seriously, that these things are always kind of being produced and reproduced in practice and kind of relational practice, then 
instead of talking about, you know, what the best option is given these fixed rules, we have to say instead, what kinds of contingencies, like what way do we want to perform the world? Which way do we actually want to make this go? What are the implications of reacting to something in a particular way? Mm -hmm. So shifting the question from, is that a threat mm -hmm. to what happens if we make that a threat? Mm -hmm. So what happens if we characterize these problems in this way? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's sort of plausible that you could, but sort of what are the impacts? What's the implications of having done that rather than what I would argue is probably the unanswerable question of whether something actually is a threat or not, mm -hmm. because I don't know that that's the sort of question that you can come up with a definitive uh, sort of compelling answer to. Mm -hmm. um, you say, all right, so what, what's at stake here? What happens if we push it off in a particular direction versus something else? Mm -hmm. So if we frame climate change as a security issue, mm -hmm. kind of what is that not is it a security issue? That's in that sense, that's sort of the wrong question. The mm -hmm. question is what happens if you frame it as a security issue and mm -hmm. what difference does that make in terms of how policy might work? Mm -hmm. So then you present to the policymaker, here are these different options, but you could frame it this way and sort of go like this and you could go this way. Now, the problem of course, is that that cuts directly against the standard policy making discourse, mm -hmm. which is not really interested in that question. It is more interested in the, but is it a threat or not? <laughs> question uh, because of the way that, that that sort of system tends to often be set up. Um, and for well, me, can this I, is- Can I just, uh, sorry, please. sorry to interrupt you. Can I just, no. uh, um, because I can think about something. Uh, exactly in relation to your example, actually, in, in relation to the environment and, and climate change, uh, because, um, and also in relation to what happens if you frame it like this and what is or what is not. Um, so many governments and the European Union, they have actually framed the mm -hmm. climate or climate change uh, or the environment uh, or climate change as a threat to the environment, right? They have already done that, uh, yeah. uh, but nothing happens. Or mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that nothing happens, but yeah. there, there, there is critique uh, saying that the, um, uh, yeah, the changes that needs to be implemented for something to actually change for real or to have some kind of uh, yeah, thorough radical change that actually prevents climate change and protects the environment and so on is lacking. Yeah. Uh, despite the framing of the environment as a security threat. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's, and and, and yeah. I think the role the role of the realist constructivist at that point would be to say, okay. So let's think about the contingency of framing that way. Let's look at the kinds of effects that were produced by framing it that way. Because this is an active, creative moment of constitution, we don't have to keep framing it that way. We could frame it in some other way. Mm -hmm. Just opening up that possibility of reframing it, I think is a really important reminder mm -hmm. for the policymaking process. Um, because you know, if you think about, it, think about it sort of practically, a policymaker who's attempting to get something through is mm -hmm. going to reach for the resources that they think are going to be most helpful with sort of underscoring the urgency of it. So mm -hmm. they grab something and they use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, not a climate change example, but we go back to, uh, to the early days of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And in US foreign policy, uh, uh, there was a, a concerted effort by people like Dean Acheson to frame US support for non-communist regimes in different parts of the world as part of a theory of falling dominoes, whereby if one of them fell, then there'd be a chain reaction and they'd all fall and that would eventually lead to the destruction of the United States. That is not the only way that communism could have been framed, mm -hmm. but it was the way communism was framed and that had certain kinds of implications. Yeah, yeah. So the, the wave of American historians who came along afterwards and were revisionists about this, spent their time trying to argue that communism was never the kind of threat that people at the time thought it was. Okay, whatever. The realist constructivist intervention here would be to say not it was or it wasn't a threat, but there are consequences to the way it was framed. Mm -hmm. And maybe framing it differently would lead us in different kinds of directions. So you show as a matter of historical research where those points of contingency are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I did my, my, did my, my work on post-war Germany, that's kind of what I've tried to do is show where these moments of contingency are. Mm -hmm. Where could we have done different things mm -hmm. that would have led in a different kind of policy direction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think from, from the perspective of a policymaker, what that does is it gives them a certain awareness of, of their own possibility. 
right? Of like how we could sort of push things off in different sorts of directions. And it makes policy making into more of a creative act rather mm -hmm. than just kind of a response to, to, uh, to something that they can't really, they can't really change. So for me, the best way to do that though is not in a policy brief, because the very discourse of a policy brief is tends to uh, frown on that kind of, of open-endedness. Uh, yeah. But instead, the use of an academic space as a space of reflection mm -hmm. to bring the policymaker into that space mm -hmm. and to have them be involved in a process of thinking things through mm -hmm. in the way that we want our students to be thinking things through. Mm -hmm. And if the student has been trained and taught in that kind of environment and they go into the policy making world maybe they bring a little bit of that sensibility with them mm -hmm. and perhaps even draw back on the resources of the university to say hey can we host a seminar on this mm -hmm. so maybe we can have a more freewheeling kind of discussion that would open up different sorts of possibilities mm -hmm. so in a way it's it's an indirect set of policy uh, influences rather than a direct i'm going to produce the report that's going to actually push us in this particular direction because this is the best direction to go in mm -hmm. um, and I think there's an important function there for universities to play. There's an important uh, sort of public intellectual function, if you will, that kind of scholars can play in creating that space and opening those sorts of, of moments of contingency so that people can start thinking those things through. Mm -hmm. And I think then in terms of advice for students, you know, be aware that that's kind of the best thing you can get from being at university. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what university spaces are for being able to open up these kinds of speculative moments. So mm -hmm. you can say, oh, you know, it could actually be different. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can explore different sorts of options here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not all possibilities are live possibilities at the same time. So the careful sifting through, we might agree, okay, there are certain things that just aren't going to work, mm -hmm. at least not right now. But let's keep them on the back burner because maybe they will at some future point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, that, that's kind of the, the, the function that the university can provide. And it's the function that being a student can provide is kind of opening those sorts of things up. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think calling attention to contingency mm -hmm. and, and restoring that awareness of counterfactual trajectories that opens mm -hmm. up creative possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the best thing that we can bring to policy. And I think it's also the best thing we can bring both to students and then as students, what can be brought into the world. Mm. So. Yeah, that was a very good advice. I, I hope the students take that into account and uh, adopt that approach. Uh, wow, it has been a very long interview. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, taking uh, your time and thank you for participating. Uh, and yeah, uh, awesome, again, thanks. Uh, I think this problem. is basically it. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. It was yeah. uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. All the and best. Feel free, feel, feel free to cut some of that if you need to cut it for time. So. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> no worries. <laughs>